uh, our seminar series at CVRTI. We're, we're uh, excited about <clears throat> having Dr. Um, Dontano with us today. Um, by way of announcement, we have uh, next week, we have Kirk Knowlton from um, Intermountain Healthcare, the, the director of uh, the chair of cardiovascular um, medicine or cardiovascular department at, at IMC uh, will be speaking to us on Thursday. Um, and then uh, next month, we, we have a whole new series with, with our RIP seminars coming up. Um, again, those are, those are filled up for this, uh, this semester, but we'll, we'll be coming, uh, inviting speakers for, for the fall here pretty soon as well. Um, uh, by way of introduction, again, we're, we're grateful that uh, Tony's come to, to speak with us today. Um, it, looking at his, his bio sketch, he, he did his bachelor's and master's at University of Colorado in Boulder and, and then did his PhD at uh, Texas A&M. And then it, he did a couple of postdocs, one at, at uh, UC San Diego um, for a couple of years and then went to, uh, back to UC Boulder um, to, to do another postdoc position there. Um, and then he came to the University of Utah and the, and the VA um, Medical Center uh, to, to continue his work here. Um, Again, kind of went through the ranks, assistant professor, associate professor, he's a, a full professor and, and uh, at, at, uh, does most of his work at the VA center, I understand, and, and, but, but also um, has his, his position um, at the university. He, he uh, is really a leader in, in, in um, vascular biology, which is an area at CVRTI that we, we haven't had as much strength. So we're excited to hear more about the great work that's going on here. Um, he reviews grants for the NIH, um, particularly uh, with the aging, uh, remind me what the section? Geriatrics. Geriatrics section, okay. Um, his work is funded through a combination of, of uh, mechanisms. I, I, I noticed you have an SBIR, STTR, is one, one of the projects you're working on, a couple different R01s, um, he's got VA. Um, uh, funding as well, um, amongst other things, and, and you know, a series of, of, of high impact publications uh, and, and uh, really great things going on in his lab and great, great trajectory with, uh, you know, where things are going. Um, so with, with that uh, introduction, we'll turn the time over to Tony, if, if we can end, you know, 10 or 15 minutes before the hour for questions at the end would, would be um, terrific. Thank you for, for being here. I'll do my best. All right, I'd like to obviously thank uh, Derek and Robin for having me here. Um, and and uh, I've been at the university for since 2010. So this is my first talk at the CVRTI. So I'm glad that you guys invited me up and hopefully um, I can come again before I retire. Um, anyway, so today I'm gonna give you guys a a quick um, story on something that is one of the major themes in our lab and it's funded through NIH. And you know the, the goal of this is really to understand how arterial senescence is acquired through the aging process and what role um, telomeres and telomere function plays and how senescence and telomere dysfunction may be a major factor in the phenotypes we see in older adults in the vasculature. Didn't change, okay. Let's see if I can get these slides to change. Oh, there we go. I'll just click it there. So I do have a disclosure. I'm a scientific advisor and I have significant stock, stock holdings in recursion pharmaceuticals, which is part of the R44 where we are trying to find novel senolytics, but none of that data will be presented today. So um, this is all independent of my work with recursion. So I don't need to go into great depth for um, the importance of understanding cardiovascular disease, but everybody here and most of the people online will know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the United States and developed countries. Um, so obviously makes a huge clinical impact. And more importantly, I think, we need to come up with new uh, novel targets and drugs for these cardiovascular diseases 
to help prevent um, this from continuing. Um, because I'm a, ger well, I'm not a geriatrician, but I do aging research. I'm an aging researcher. Um, we know that age is um, the best predictor of future, future cardiovascular disease risk and death. And those are from large uh, epidemiological studies like the Framingham Heart Study. This is just a very simple um, diagram just showing the percent of the population diagnosed with cardiovascular disease goes up nearly linearly with advancing age. Um, one of the reasons my lab and I got interested in arterial function is the majority of cardiovascular deaths each year are due to arterial diseases. That would include coronary heart disease and stroke. Um, high blood pressure has a vascular component and obviously um, peripheral artery disease or diseases of the arteries. Um, that makes up a majority of deaths. So we think understanding the physiology and pathology of arteries is of utmost importance if we're gonna start helping um, reduce cardiovascular deaths. So why do I study aging and why do I, why do I not study pathology? Um, and that's probably, uh, this is something I set up for all my cardiologists, friends that I talk to, because they don't really get it sometimes. But uh, about 20 years ago, Ed Licata, who's a cardiologist and ran the Baltimore Longitudinal Study, um, had started publishing data just showing these very pronounced changes in the vascular function in older adults who had no frank cardiovascular disease. And these were made up of arterial stiffening, so large artery stiffening of the aorta and the carotid arter arteries, thickening of the large elastic arteries, and also endothelial dysfunction, which is the lining of the lumen of the arteries. And what he showed and proposed is this diagram here, is that when you're in normal aging, so this is um, healthy, this is what we'd call healthy people, even older healthy people start developing these phenotypes, which lead to increases in pulse pressure, um, arterial stiffening increases afterload on the left ventricle, so you get increases in left ventricular mass, and endothelial dysfunction causes a, a host of changes which really set the table for frank atherosclerosis. And so he promoted the fact that we need to understand how these initiating events build up because that's a place to easily intervene. And we've shown in, in numerous studies that I've done over the last 20 some odd years that we can reverse these acutely um, with interventions or at least ameliorate some of the dysfunction. Whereas once you get into full bone systolic hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy, heart failure, coronary ischemia, it's much harder to reverse the flow, to stem the tide. So I think this is really why um, I'm passionate about healthy aging and understanding the, the, the basic biology of aging, which is leading to these changes and figuring out, you know, are there ways to target this? or are there novel therapeutics we could use um, to try to intervene as early as possible? So I'll just give you a, a summary. This is uh, a, a slide I did for uh, a research review on cardiovascular aging and CERC research. But ba basically, this is just showing the percent change from youth in some of these parameters, such as large artery stiffening in the green here. And you can see it kind of goes li up linearly with age until around 60. And then it really goes up, the arteries get stiffer and stiffer and stiffer, uh, more fibrotic after the age of 60. When we look at endothelial function or how the, the endothelium ability to vasodilate to agonist or shear, you can see in small resistance arterioles, you have a decline in endothelial function very early on. And that persists all the way out and almost flat plateaus um, down between 60 and 80. And when we look at large artery endothelial functions, such as brachial artery flow mediated dilation, that seems to be intact almost, almost into middle age, and then it starts declining. Um, definitely in that category, sort of postmenopausal women have a very steep drop off in that function. So I'm going to summarize probably 10 years of my work as a PhD student and postdoc on one slide so I can get to stuff that I think is um, more newer and I think more interesting. But basically we've, I spent 10 years of my life figuring out what oxidant enzymes are elevated in endothelial cells and 
if we block oxidative stress, can we improve endothelial function? Um, we know that there's a vicious cycle in older adults' endothelial cells and arteries where superoxide is abundant. That helps promote this vicious cycle of nf kappa B activation, inflammatory cytokines, which then can promote even more um, oxidative stress. This helps prevent one of the major vasodilators, nitric oxide, from inducing relaxation in small or even large um, arteries. And nitric oxide, for those of you who don't know, is a major atherogenic molecule. So when you have lots of nitric oxide, um, or at least it's in balance, um, you tend to have less atherogenic potential. Your sort of adhesion molecules are down and all, all of that. So in addition to just the, vaso, the vasorelaxation component, there's a sort of anti-atherogenic component of nitric oxide. And this is quenched by superoxide and becomes a, a markers of oxidative stress. Furthermore, when we look at arterial stiffening, this is also um, exacerbated by increases in oxidative stress and inflammation, though it tends to go through the TGF beta and MMPs, which tend to increase collagen production and break down more elastin, creating a more fibrotic extracellular matrix. Um, while we can, if we give antioxidants and anti-inflammatories and endothelial, um, and look at endothelial function, we can almost purely restore function in healthy older adults. This is not the case um, due to the fibrosis and large artery stiffening. We can give those and we'll see some improvement, but not nearly the improvements we would see in endothelial function. So endothelial function appears to be a little bit more plastic um, in older adults, whereas large artery stiffening is it's much more it's much harder to to turn back the clock. Let's say. Okay, so a big part of this talk is understanding cellular senescence. And so, what is cellular senescence? So we have a healthy cell here on the left. Um, it's going to have some sort of senescence-inducing stimuli, which could be telomere dysfunction, DNA damage, growth factor signaling. And what is a evolutionarily gain? Um, what you'll see is that these cells, when having a ton of DNA damage, they will either go through apoptosis or senescence. And senescence is a tumor suppressor pathway. So we don't want to have healthy cells undergo a ton of DNA damage and then keep replicating because you might get cancer. But as you age, once you get to sort of reproductive years, that turns from being an advantage to deleterious because these senescent cells accumulate around the body and they have a very interesting profile. So the profile that they have is they're very apoptotic resistant. They're very hard cells to kill. Um, I've done a lot of drug work on these cells and it's not easy to find drugs that can actually kill these cells and keep the healthy cells alive. Um, they have this pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidant senescence associated secretory phenotype. Um, and it tends to be heterogeneous depending on the cell type and what the inducer of senescence was. Um, it's very different depending on fibroblasts versus endothelial cells. Um, but generally, it's thought to include increases in IL-1 beta, IL-6, IL-8, chemokines such as MCP1, um, and increases in reactive oxygen species. So as you get older, what we do know about older people is they have a low-grade inflammation. And this senescence hypothesis that you accumulate senescent cells as you get older makes sense because you're not going to have a huge amount of senescent cells um, in a tissue because it just wouldn't be functional. But you would, could have enough to increase just and, and disturb the healthy cells to produce more cytokines and reactive oxygen species. Um, a couple of markers of senescent cells are these cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. And these are things that prevent the cell from actually undergoing division. So this would be P16 and P21. So are senescent cells in plaques? The answer is yes. So Minamino in 2002 showed in carotid atheromas, they stain these cells with beta-galactosidase and it turns blue. Senescent cells tend to turn blue. Um, and they should show that there were senescent cells within atheromas. And if you look into to the internal mammary artery, which doesn't have any atheromas, they didn't see any in these patients. Also, if you look in 
vascular smooth muscle cells, and you look at these cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors, which are markers for senescence, they're elevated in um, plaque samples versus normal samples. So back in uh, my postdoc, we collected endothelial cell biopsies. So we put a J wire into the vein or the artery and scrape off endothelial cells from young and older um, individuals. We dissociate those cells in buffers and then fix them and then plate them on slides and do immunofluorescent staining on them. And while I did, wasn't in Boulder by the time we finished the study, I started this study. And what we were looking at, we were looking at a measure of endothelial dependent dilation with brachial artery flow media dilation. And we were interested to see um, what age related changes in endothelial cells looked like for these cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors that would indicate senescence. And what we saw was that and this is Matt Rossman, who was a UVRL a PhD student, went to Doug Seal's lab and actually helped me finish the project since I wasn't there. But what we saw was that. With sedentary aging, so this is young sedentary, older sedentary, we see an increase in both P21 and P16 in these venous endothelial cells. We also did this in arterial cells and saw the same pattern. I'm just showing the venous um, for ease. Um, but we also showed that if you took from habitually aerobically active individuals, those endothelial cells, they did not have a significant age-related increase compared to the young sedentary. So there is some lifestyle benefit to those endothelial cells. Furthermore, we showed that if we did brachial artery flow mediated dilation, which is an index of how well the endothelium is able to dilate in those large arteries, we saw a negative correlation for both P21 and P16. Whereas if you tended to have high levels of those senescence markers, you tended to have blunted endothelial function. Setting up, there's an association at least between senescence and endothelial function. This was followed up um, in preclinical studies um, in the Mayo Clinic by Jim Kirkland's group. And they did a really cool study where they found the original um, senolytics, which is denacitib and quercetin. And they put these into old animals versus vehicles. And this is aortic um, vasorelaxation. So in the open circles, you can see that in response to the muscarinic agonist acetylcholine, which acts on the endothelium, releases nitric oxide and creates vasorelaxation, there's almost no vasodilation in these old aortas. If they treated the animals with D and Q and removed the senescent cells, they actually saw an increase in endothelial dependent dilation, giving uh, prudence to the fact that senescent cells actually suppress endothelial function in older arteries. So we get into this story a little more because we were interested in telomere dysfunction. And I'll get into a little bit of why we chose looking at telomere dysfunction versus um, DNA damage and other factors that can induce senescence in a second. But we'll get into a little background into telomere biology because I'm not sure how many people actually are super familiar with it. So um, DNA is obviously in the nucleus and your chromosomes are there. And the telomeres are, are caps to the end of the chromosomes. They're made up of nucleotide repeats, TTA, GGG, um, and they shorten with each cell division because of the end replication problem. I could get into that if people are interested, but they shorten. They're, if you culture cells for a long time, the telomeres become shorter and shorter. Eventually, they'll stop dividing and become senescent. But telomeres are a little more complicated than just these long strings at the end of the chromosomes. They actually make a functional T loop, um, which is important for a couple things, and I'll get into it um, later. But this T loop is a structure which is, is critically important from the cell's um, standpoint. And this is one of the things we think is really critical. Um, but to go into just most people, when they think of telomeres, think of data like this. This is data from Richard Cawthon, who's a professor here. Um, has been, and he helped us with the study, but this is a study he did a long time ago. He took white blood cells, he did PCR for mean telomere length, and what he found was that if you took white blood cells from 60 to 74 year old people, the people that tended to have longer telomeres survived, um, and the people who had shorter telomeres had lower survival rates. And this is what most people, when they hear about telomeres in the news and everything, 
almost globally, the data looks like this. If you're healthy, you tend to have longer white blood cell telomeres. If you're sicker, whatever that malady may be, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, inflammation, you have shorter telomeres. And so my first PhD student and I were sitting down talking about this. We're like, well, one is, is how representative of white blood cells of vasculature, of endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells. They're much, they proliferate much quicker. The turnover is much faster. Also, my question is really, you know, is this just a surrogate for inflammation? If you're more inflamed, I can create CRP curves that look just like this. People who are more inflamed that are older versus lo less inflamed and create profiles that look just like this. And so is this white blood cell telomere length just because people who are more inflamed tend to have a higher proliferation rate um, of white blood cells and that's just driving their cells lower. So we, we wanted to get deeper into it, understand more about what's actually going on with the telomeres in the vasculature. So again, like it makes this T loop, it reinvades this strand. Um, this is what we would call a cat telomere. And the reason why they have to have this structure is that if you have a telomere that's uncapped, so it's just a single strand, it looks like a double stranded DNA break. And that's going to uh, have the the DNA response elements, 53 BP1, gamma H2X, ATM, that's, they're gonna go there like it's a broken piece of DNA and they're gonna try to fix it. Or they're gonna actually cause tumor suppressors like P16, P21 to go up and induce senescence. So it's critical that these telomeres stay in that formation um, unless the cell is dividing. Otherwise it looks like a DNA damage, like double-stranded DNA break. There's a couple proteins, they're called Sheltrin, that help keep this conformation. And I'll only talk about one of them today, but TERF2 is one of these Sheltrin proteins, which is critical for maintenance of that T-loop formation. If you delete TERF2, you will get uncapped telomeres, you will get a heavy, heavy DNA damage response. Um, and so these are critical proteins to help make this formation. The other thing to understand is telomeres are, we're starting to understand more telomeres are stress sensors. The guanine are particularly susceptible to oxidation. So one hypothesis of why telomeres become dysfunctional is that if you're in an area of oxidative stress, these guanines can get oxidized. And then it's actually more difficult for the shelter and protein to bind and create the T-loop. So you could have alterations in telomeres, either in the shelter and proteins or in oxidation or just DNA, DNA breaks within the telomeres that can all cause um, issues such as bonding's oxidized, the T-loop gets unfertile, then you see basically a double-stranded DNA break. So again, I think it's more complex than just length. There's definitely ways where telomeres can, you'll get telomere attrition with many, many, many um, population doublings of cells, but whether that actually happens in the human body and in cells, especially the vasculature that don't divide that often um, is, is a question. So they act as stress sensors. What will happen, and this is um, one of the techniques we use, which is in situ hybridization um, with a fluorescent DNA damage marker. So what you see here is basically an endothelial cell nucleus, then you see every single green dot is a telomere. And then we'll stain with 53BP1, which is one of those DNA damage response elements. And when they co-localize, that's what we'd call an uncapped telomere or a telomere-induced foci, which I will use kind of synonymously the rest of the talk. So why did we pick telomeres versus just general DNA damage? Well, I'm not going to get into all the studies. I don't have time for them, but um, several studies have shown in a variety of cell types that DNA damage at telomeres cannot be repaired or resolved like general DNA damage. Um, this specifically drives uncapped or telomere-induced foci to induce senescence preferentially um, versus just generalized DNA damage, which can be repaired. It's just how much DNA damage you get. If it's a small amount of DNA damage, the cell will repair it. The, the DNA damage signaling will be there, and then it'll go away. Um, so this is one of the reasons why 
we've decided to take on this. So now um, we're going to talk about, we're going to get to some of the data. Does telomere dysfunction occur in, with advancing age and produce a senescent phenotype in arteries? So this was a study done a long time ago by uh, a previous PhD student who was tricky enough to trick me into actually taking this project on. And this is kind of a good mentoring point. Like you kind of, it's kind of like giving your kid the keys to the car. You don't buy, buy them like a brand new Ferrari. You like, you go, okay, here's the Volkswagen bug. Like take that out for a drive and let's see how you do. And then if they come back and it's not destroyed, you're like, okay, maybe you get like a Nissan Maxima next time. And so Garrett and I went through this sort of step-by-step -step process where he would be like, okay, come back with some data. Let's try this. Let's try this. And I'd be like, okay, you get a little bit more. And so I think it's a good mentoring point in the sense that you got to let people who are really motivated drive, but you want to give them, you know, measured leash. So he took on this project where we hypothesized that there'd be aging would lead to telomere uncapping, which would lead to senescence and senescence associated inflammation, which eventually leads to chronic arterial dysfunction. We did, um, we were lucky enough to get human arterial biopsies. So we were getting sentinel lymph node biopsies from melanoma patients, and we'd get a little piece of feed artery from those biopsies, and we saved a hundred of those. Um, we excluded anybody who had metastatic melanoma, because obviously that messes with telomeres um, a bit, um, probably not in the arterial system, but we still excluded them. He did chromatin immune pre precipitation, where he was looking at proteins bound to DNA. Um, and then he did some RT-PCR for some of the, the uh, inflammatory factors. And then he did qPCR for mean telomere length. And this is what he found. So he found, as I think we predicted, well, we expected that telomere length does indeed go down in whole arteries with advancing age. And it goes down in a sort of stepwise fashion. When we looked at gamma H2X, so this is phosphorylated gamma H2X, which is a marker for DNA, double-stranded DNA damage. Um, what we found was that this indeed was increased but this was actually at telomeres. So this is what this is a marker of telomere uncapping or telomere-induced foci. And what we saw was that indeed the older group had significantly higher um, telomere uncapping versus the young group. Also, we found that um, P53 bound to the P21 promoter. So this is a DNA damage signaling. So this is a transcription factor which is going to upregulate. Um, one of those senescence markers was elevated in the older arteries versus the younger. So we saw that and we were pretty excited. And the first thing we thought was like, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, all these things were correlated that the telomere like shortening leads to the double stranded break signal at the telomeres and that leads to senescence. And that would be such a clean story. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna be famous. And what we saw was kind of perplexing and we, kind of got hammered in the review process for it. But what we found was that the telomere uncapping was, so the gamma H2X was correlated with the senescent signaling markers, but it, neither of those was correlated at all with telomere length, indicating that telomere length was most likely not driving this process. And so we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and go, okay, well, how do we think this is actually working? So I'll get to that, how we think it's working in a little bit. But um, one of the things that um, Sam, who's sitting in the audience and has been taking the keys to the, it's more of a Ferrari now because we've got funding to do it. And, um, but he was interested in figuring out exactly what cell type. So those were whole artery homogenates. And he was interested in figuring out what cell type was actually responsible. So again, we do this in situ hybridization. So we have a hybridization probe that binds to telomeric DNA. The brighter that signal, the more of it that's bound, so the longer the telomeres. We use our 53 BP1, double, our DNA damage marker. And then when they co-localize telomeres and that, we would in, call that a telomere-induced foci or uncapped telomere. And so quickly, um, we took mouse lung endothelial cells. We dispersed lungs isolated the endothelial cells and did this staining. And what we saw was about a five-fold increase in TIFs, in cells with TIFs in these older ones, indicating that endothelial cells from the lung 
definitely have augmented um, telomere damage. And this is um, actually human cells from Lonza. So we can just, we just pick young donors versus old donors. So a person who's 29 versus a person who is 67, and they're both female. And in those cultured cells, we see four times the amount of TIFs in the older lung endothelial cells. So definitely occurs if you take cells, disperse them, and then stain them. But again, what, what's going on with the smooth muscle? Is this, is this homogeneous? Are we seeing the same amount of damage um, in the endothelium as we are in the vascular smooth muscles? So then Sam did in-face preps. So he took an aorta and filleted open and did the staining and used confocal microscopy to image the endothelial layer and then go down below the endothelial layer into the smooth muscle layer. And this is done also by a, a med student who he used to be a technician. He's in med school now, Jordan Tucker, because this is really time exhaustive stuff. But basically what he saw was that in the young, not very many cells. In the old, while the variance is very high, there was significantly more cells with telomere-induced foci in the aorta in these endothelial cells. But again, when we look over at the smooth muscle cells, we didn't see almost any telomere-induced foci in the, the smooth muscle cells that were just below that endothelial cell layer, indicating that this endothelium seems to be susceptible to this with aging. So again, we wanted to kind of probe this, this mechanism of is it telomere length or is it telomere length independent? So Sam's done some really nice analysis here where first we just looked at correlations between telomere length and the percent of endothelial cells with telomere damage and it's a straight line. There's not really any association, um, but to go even deeper, um, we wanted to look at tel cells like telomere length in cells that did have telomere induced foci and did not with aging. So when we look at cells without telomere induced foci, we see a, a, a pretty much a significant reduction in telomere length. Nothing major, this is a very modest. If you were anticipating telomere length to, to hysterically get so short that they would stop, you would be anticipating like a 60% reduction in telomere length or maybe even more. Um, and then when we looked at cells with the TIFs, we did see a significant decline, but again, it's a pretty modest decline. So then to Sam looked and he goes, okay, well, what if we look at the longest telomeres and the shortest telomeres, and maybe that'll, it should be the ones with the shortest telomeres that have the most TIFs. The ones with long ones, if it was telomere length dependent, shouldn't matter. So he basically looked at max telomere length in cells without TIFs, you see a decline, and you also see a decline in the max telomere length in endothelial cells with a TIF. But when you look down at the shortest telomere lengths, one, there's, there's really no aging effect. The shortest telomeres with and without the TIFs aren't different and they're the same, indicating to us that this is not at all driven by telomere length. So it's most likely um, telomeres acting as a sensor or sheltering issues um, with these, in these endothelial cells. So then lastly, and I, we threw this slide in because there are people here who do a lot of disease stuff. He looked in different regions of the aorta for these telomere-induced foci. So as you, most of you know, the minor arch has a lot of turbulent flow in the aorta. It's, a, it's probably the most afro-prone area. And our hypothesis was that probably like turbulent flow across the endothelium induces a lot of oxidative stress, dysfunction, and that would probably be the area that is most likely to have a lot of senescence and telomere-induced foci. Whereas when we looked in like the descending thoracic aorta, that's much more laminar flow and we'd be less likely. And when we looked at the data, what we saw was just that the minor arch had a huge increase in cells with TIFs. Um, there was no significant difference in the vascular smooth muscle below that. And then as we get to the major arch, while there are regions of extremely turbulent flow, for the most part, when you get away from the branches, it's, it's much more laminar. And what we saw was the 
there was still a trend towards increases, but it's not nearly the magnitude of cells that actually had damage. And again, the smooth muscle cells didn't show any effect. And then when we look in the, the descending thoracic aorta where more laminar flow is, there were no differences with aging. So there's this aging turbulence sort of um, additive effect, which we really think is probably the most important thing for inducing this type of damage and senescence. So again, I think you know that's that was our our hypothesis. We think that the endothelium is particularly susceptible to these things, maybe because there's circulating oxidants and damage, but it also could be due to um, the turbulence and the metabolism of endothelial cells in turbulent areas. So now we started, um, and this is going back to Garrett's. We basically got a mouse model um, where we delete the turf two. So that's that critical sheltering protein that helps maintain the T loop. Because what we really wanted to show was like, okay, we know that there's dysfunction with aging. We can see telomere dysfunction and uncapping in telomeres. So what happens if we get a totally healthy mouse, we knock out turf two, do we gonna see arterial dysfunction that would recapitulate what we see with aging? And so this, is a, this was uh, our first step. So we used, um, the Prelox inducible system with the Rosa Cree, so it's whole body. Um, we did some endothelial function and we looked at um, some senescence markers. And I'll, I'll, we can talk about the breeding later. I think most people are fairly familiar with the Prelox system. So, um, and this, is, this was published a couple of years ago, um, but basically I'm not gonna go through all his data, but what we saw was that in, this is the white are our plus plus, so wild type Cree plus with tamoxifen. So this would be your wild type animal, so the genetically intact. And this turf two is gonna be the flocks flocks Cree plus with tamoxifen, so the knockout or the knockdown. And what he saw was increases in gamma H2X localized to telomeres. So that's our marker of telomere uncapping was increased as we'd expect. There's a huge increase in P21 positive cells within the aorta and gene expression of of this cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor P21 was also elevated. So we're inducing a uncapping, we're inducing a senescent phenotype. Then we took arteries, uh, we pressurized them um, and cannulate them on glass micropipette tips, and then we can apply endothelial vasodilators. And it kind of looks like this. So we measure the ar arterial diameter, we'll start applying acetylcholine, which again is a muscarinic receptor antagonist, which acts on the endothelium, releases nitric oxide, and then we just measure the diameters and you get these nice sort of dose response curves. And you can do this in all the animals to get functional or ex vivo functional endothelial dependent dilation. You can do some pharmacology also, which is nice. So here's what we saw. So in the white air or the right circles here was your wild type animals. Um, you get about 85% dilation. In the knockout animals, we had around 60%. So blunted endothelial dependent dilation. Um, this was due to nitric oxide because we can give um, the competitive inhibitor for L of nitric oxide synthase L name. And basically the whole they dilate as much as the knockouts. So that the delta between here and here is nitric oxide component to dilation. So there's other components such as EDHF or COX that contribute. Um, because this was a whole body knockout, we wanted to check smooth muscle vasodilation. So we gave an NO donor sodium nitroprusside, which goes straight to the smooth muscle and will relax it. And what we saw was actually similar vasodilation between indicating that this was an endothelial specific defect. So a quick story about these animals though, is this was like the full aha moment. We got these animals from a collaborator who does a lot of cancer work. And the first time we did it, we didn't use enough tamoxifen. Animals didn't, nothing happened. And we call Eros, Eros, what's going on? This is the guy who gave it to us. Garrett's freaking out and he's just like, I don't know, it's different. It's a different Rosacree. So maybe you just need to use more. And then once we got it dialed in, you give, you give your five day tamoxifen, the animals only survive for 10 days. Like that's how important this is. Like they just, they get skinny, they lordose, they get gray, 
and then they die. So all these experiments are very acute afterwards because the animals literally would would die. So again, there's there's issues with this, but that's how important like turf two is. Like, um, and I was absolutely like we keep the Rosa Cree animals just to make sure the toxin is working because it's so reproducible. So it, it was one of those things where you're like, wow, this is serious business. So um, having never used genetic models, I was like, wow, now we got something here. Um, so anyway, so we followed this up, obviously, as you, most of you would think, um, Sam's been working on using this phlox mouse in a veed here. so this is an endothelial specific Cree. Um, and he's done a bunch of studies, which we're excited about. Um, to try to prove this sort of overall hypothesis. So in his hands, we, when we look at TERF2 mRNA expression, we can flush endothelial cells from the carotid. We see about a 50% reduction in TERF2 gene expression. Whereas if we look across these other um, more homogenous um, tissues, we don't see any. So we're pretty sure that this is um, endothelial specific. If we do the IF fish, we see a huge, he hasn't quantified these, but there's, it's a lot of TIFFs in these animals, as you would hope. Um, a lot of the telomeres are lit up. There's a lot of damage going on in there. Also, when we look at these, if we just isolate endothelial cells and do this in culture and induce with the tamoxifen in culture, what we see is a lot of senescent cells. So beta-gal staining goes way up, which is what we would hope. BRDU incorporation, so senescent cells can't divide. So the, the division of cells, so BRDU goes down as we would anticipate. Um, the function of the cells, migratory distance, they're not replicating, so it's harder for them to migrate. So that goes down, down substantially. And gene expression for the cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors goes up. So we're getting a, a very robust senescent phenotype when we induce this. We also, if we take carotid arteries out of these animals, um, we see a much bigger increase in superoxide production from these arteries, even though we're just deleting TERF2 in the endothelium, the whole artery is producing a lot more um, superoxide. So oxidative stress is elevated. And they have elevations in MCP1 and IL-6. So it's filling out, we're getting a SAS, we're getting senescence, we're getting a SASP in um, these animals. So when we look at the vasodilation curves, which I just showed you, um, we see in the blue, the wild type and the endothelial knockout. So we have a significant reduction in endothelial dependent dilation. It appears that that is predominantly nitric oxide mediated because when we give L-name the competitive inhibitor, we don't see any differences and they're significantly lower. So the delta up here is all nitric oxide driven. Also, we don't see any alterations in the smooth muscle sensitivity to an external nitric oxide donor. So this is a very endothelial specific um, phenotype, which recapitulates a lot what we see with aging. Also, when we look at large artery stiffness, um, we anesthetize mice. We put Doppler probes here. Um, we look at the difference in the pulse waves and the distance here. So you get a velocity and that's an index of how stiff the large arteries are in these mice. And what we see is that in the wild type, they're around 250, and in the TERF2 knockouts, they're around 325. So that's consistent with what we see with a young versus old mouse in our laboratory and have published uh, a lot. Okay, I'm just gonna summarize now. So I think, you know, my goal here was to try to impress on you the, the functional importance of telomeres and how this may be a, a way that arterial aging actually happens. So if you have cap telomeres in the nucleus, looks good. With advanced age or loss of TERF2, um, when you uncap, you get cellular senescence, you get, you promote inflammation and reactive oxygen species. And that leads to the two sort of hallmarks of arterial aging, which would be fibrosis and large artery stiffening, and also reductions in endothelial function and nitric oxide. So I'd like to thank everybody for their time and I can take any questions. I think I thank most of the people who are, who are heavily involved, but this is our laboratory. Um, we're, we've been well-funded and we hope to continually be well-funded um, with just starting good projects like this from crazy ideas from 
graduate students. So I can take any questions now. Thank you, Tony. 